it's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Kaylee. I'm one of the producers behind the psychology of entrepreneurship. And for any new listeners, this is a weekly series where we go inside the minds of entrepreneurs, artists, athletes, and academics to decipher what is the psychology behind our decisions. In last week's volume, we revisited volume one of the series, looking into the mind of Philip McKernan and tying in parts from our more recent volumes to see how everything connects. Today, we're going to do the same thing with volume two where Ronsley talked to Dr. Sherry Walling about imposter syndrome and how it affects entrepreneurs. This has been a really common theme throughout the series, so it was interesting to see how what she said connected with other guests since then. I'll be chiming in throughout sections to introduce these extra pieces. So let's get this started and revisit Dr. Sherry Walling and how to deal with imposter syndrome. Hey, it's Ronsley. In the last episode, Philip said, I think imposter syndrome is driven by the fact that we're doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing. Which flared up the imposter inside me, which kept going on repeat. Should you be doing what you're doing? Picking up from there, I met someone who deals with voices inside the heads of entrepreneurs every day. We met in Austin, Texas, where she was the keynote highlight for this major conference. So my name is Dr. Sherry Walling, and I am a clinical psychologist, but I work in the world of entrepreneur mental health. So my my life's work is to really help people with the hard things about being an entrepreneur. And for at least the people that come through my door, that's burnout, it's depression, it's conflict in their marriages or conflict in their relationships. And so I try to use my clinical training and my personal experience being an entrepreneur and being married to an entrepreneur to help make some of those hard things a little bit easier for people. When I think about perfect guest experts for this show, Sherry takes all the boxes from a professional standpoint rather than a personal standpoint. Also, I thought. My parents grew up in the Midwest. They had these very sort of traditional Southern Baptist roots and feelings were not necessarily important. Like duty was important. Values were important. Doing the right thing was important. Being disciplined was important. Getting up early was important. Reading the Bible was important. Like those were the things that were important. And talking about things that hurt or ways that you were confused or worried, like that was not important. And that really played out in my family in a really tragic way, actually. My my dad probably had some undiagnosed bipolar 2 or some, some depression. Like, he just had some part of him that was not well. And he made some bad choices that were really, really hard on our family. And so, like, my the year of my sophomore year of high school, when I was about 15, he spent that year kind of in jail and house arrest. Like, there were just things that... I think if my family had been a little bit more psychologically minded or a little bit more open to the fact that people hurt and people get sad and and had some skills to talk about that, I think some of the pain of that story would have been circumvented. So in a way, I mean, this is a real common sort of story among psychologists is that we who are really um, sort of intuitive and sensitive to those things are seeking ways to help that not happen in other people's families. I think people's motiv- motivations are very complicated. I think anyone who's doing something that's hard has to be driven to it. And sometimes that's to fill a void. Sometimes it's to prove something. Sometimes it's because they're bored. <laughs> I mean, I think there are a handful of motivations that drive entrepreneurs. Here's Mark Fisher's point of view on what drives motivation from volume 19. One of the things that's challenging is whenever we do things, it's always multifactorial. It's always, there's always multiple motivations and there are some motivations that are more or less useful, right? So we get very nerdy and we look at behavior change psychology. These days we look at, and we won't go into nerdy detail about this, but there seem to be psychologists often break into six different strata of motivation, you move from a completely extrinsic to totally intrinsic. And what that means is sometimes we're doing stuff because we want other people to like us or give us things or whatever, or we're afraid of other people. And then sometimes we're doing stuff because we feel this is intrinsically 
we do it because we actually like it. Sometimes we do it because you're like, oh, well, I think I'm this kind of person. And I know that a person like me does this. So therefore, I'm going to do this thing. And I have a, a core desire to be consistent. This made me think about my motivations, which made me think about what I consider to be success. A couple of years ago, when Tony Robbins came out with the his podcast and released an episode, well, two episodes, it was a two-part series on his interview with coach John Wooden. After a few pages of notes, my big takeaway from that two-hour special was that I really needed my own definition of success. Not one that was just accepted by the norm or was just handed down to me. And I would ask you to do the same. I would ask you to really ask yourself, if I achieve this thing, am I going to be happy? Because I know a lot of us have different motivations as Sherry continues. I don't know that all of us have sort of the, a, a deep languishing hole within ourselves that we feel the need to, to fill or prove otherwise. But I do think that when you're signing up for something that requires you to work so hard and put so much of yourself on the line, you have to have a really pretty deep motivation to get that done. When it comes to motivation and definitions of what success looks like, we look to mentors, influences, and authority figures. I spoke about my phase of idolizing my mentors in the Philip McKernan episode, and part of that came with this weird desire inside me to rebel against the authorities. So, um, Sherry, what's up with that? We also have kind of a conflicted relationship with authority. And someone who, you know, I don't know, like, for example, somebody like Tim Ferriss, who just, he seems, he's so sure of himself and he seems so cool and he seems so thoughtful. And, and you know, I don't know Tim. And I think he, he does pay attention to science in some things. So, again, I'm not lambasting him as the, the, the evil example or anything. But I think someone like that is so much easier to access and relate to than my colleagues at Yale who write with really big words and lots of statistical terminology that's like, who, who the hell knows what they're saying? So I think we are, we are drawn to authorities with whom we resonate or who we admire. And again, I think the scientific community has not done that great at being relatable. And that's, that's left open a wide space for people to be drawn to information that may not be accurate, but it f but feels right. In volume 18, UJ Ramdas gave us his reasoning behind why he sometimes has conflict with authority. And honestly, he's got a really fair point. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, have a, I have a history of, of uh, disrespecting, I would say misplaced authority. Because uh -huh. I know the difference between you know, well-placed authority and misplaced authority. Yeah. A well-placed authority is someone who answers my questions and I'm impressed, uh, right? A displaced authority, like a misplaced authority is someone who's just fucking there because they're getting paid for it uh -huh. and they don't actually know what they're doing. To say that I debate with the paradoxes and oxymorons that exist between things is an understatement. Whether the love-hate weird relationship with authority or the difficulty when it comes to bringing art and science together or creativity and commerciality. Back in 2005, I wrote a master's thesis bringing two such fields together that was initially thought not to mix at all. In fact, my supervisors told me not to pick that as a topic for my dissertation. What did I do? I rebelled. <laughs> uh, I wrote it anyway. And now there are conferences about the joining of rigid quality software systems with agile ones. Jargon and software lingo aside, I wanted to explore what Dr. Sherry, who was clearly so academic and clinical in her responses, thought about science and if there was any art involved. Great science also has an element of art because it's great thinking. And great thinking is creative. It's a different way of problem solving. So the best scientists that I know are, they're, they're, it's science and art together. Yeah. Because when you're asking a question, I mean, there, I mean, there is a brilliance to asking a good question that involves you being able to sort of turn the world on its head and think about it in a different way. And even to test a hypothesis, yes, you have these tools and you're limited by the rules of statistics, but there are all kinds of creative ways to ask questions and get at an underlying variable, especially in psychology, because the things that we care about are really hard to measure. 
And a lot of the clinical work that I've done in clinical research, we're often trying to measure something that didn't happen, which is its own like yes. mind blowing problem. So again, I, I don't, I don't see this vast separateness between science and the rest of the world. I think great science is really informed by the gritty day to day and is also pretty artistic. Did you know that I didn't think I was creative until a few years ago when a friend challenged me about it? I was sitting with his friend having a drink and I kept telling him how technical I was. Well, I had a master's of software engineering. Could I be more technical? This was at a time when I opened a, and operated a Portuguese Indian restaurant in Brisbane, a story for another time. He listened to me make up excuse after excuse and then said, so you build a restaurant from scratch with a menu that never existed before and right now there are people eating there and paying you for it and you think you're not creative? Talk about a brick to the head. I think entrepreneurship is all about the creative, but that creation has to be sustainable. Sustaining your art is where you commercialize that creative. But to hell with my definitions. I think anyone that signs their own paycheck you know, it's not that nuanced in, in a sense, like it's, you are responsible for the, at the basic level, like the money coming in, no one else is paying, no one else is signing your pay paycheck. Like you're the one. I think there's a tendency toward entrepreneurs to be some, to be folks who have not necessarily succeeded in traditional paths. According to economist Josef Alois Schumpeter, entrepreneurs are not necessarily motivated by profit, but regarded as a standard for measuring achievement or success. I also wanted to know who the early adopters of the entrepreneurship lifestyle were. What drove people to sign their own paycheck? I think there's a tendency toward entrepreneurs to be some, to be folks who have not necessarily succeeded in traditional paths. So lots of folks who are real high IQ, but didn't do great in school or couldn't sit still or just didn't like it. Or folks who did well in, you know, or who had high achieving, you know, jobs at Google or whatever, but, but found them to be too constricting or didn't like how much they had to work. They wanted more freedom. So they're, they are, they're tinkerers. They're people who are unsatisfied with the variables in their lives. And so they're looking to to change the variables or change the path. Is a founder different from an entrepreneur? I think of the founder as somebody who, somebody who made the thing, right? Somebody who started the company. But it, I mean, I think there's, there's some nuance in the sense that a lot of entrepreneurs I know also buy companies. So, you know, maybe founder implies like you, you're there day one, putting the, putting the bricks together on the first day. Um, but an entrepreneur can sort of come about that role in a couple of different ways. So if that's an entrepreneur, what are the topics that they don't generally talk about? Or what are the topics that we don't generally talk about? There is definitely a paradox between wanting to sign your own paychecks and living in this unknown for extended periods of time, for me at least. But how does that play out? I think as humans, we all go through a series of moments in our lives or phases of our life where we're we're oriented we have it all together we feel really cohesive and then flow calm centered on top of it and then we inevitably sort of shift back over into like angst and disorientation and like what's next or some sort of painful crisis. There is an ebb and flow to everyone's mental, emotional life. I think that is amplified with entrepreneurs because they're, again, the relationship with the business sort of adds this extra pull toward whatever the business is doing. So there's the human and then there's the business and they're growing and they're failing and they're growing and they're failing and the, the two are somewhat intertwined. It's an extension of the self. I mean... There's, there's no doubt about that. I think people can sort of say, oh, I don't feel like that about my business. But like on a, neuro, on a neurological level, you do. Like they, there's a really interesting study that's looked at brain scans of entrepreneurs who are thinking about, um, they did four 
four little uh, prompts in an, a functional MRI machine. So they had people look at um, an image of a business that was not their business, but like some sort of neutral. And then they had people look at an image of their business, whether it's the, a picture of the office or the logo. And then they had people look at a neutral child and they had people look at their own child. So um, they looked at what parts of the brain were activated, really comparing the relationship between how, what happens neurologically when we think about our own children and when we think about our business. And like no surprise for those of us who think about these things, it, our brains are really, really, really similar, which means that our reward centers are activated. The striatum, the part of the brain that's like kind of ooey gooey, attached, affectionate, in love even. And then we also see this suppression of the parts of the brain that are responsible for mentalization, which, which is the ability to perceive something as separate from us and to anticipate how that entity will act. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit in the weeds, but like the bottom line is entrepreneurs really don't perceive their company as separate from themselves, but they they perceive it as an extension of themselves, one that they're highly biased toward, sure. they're attached to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's hard for me to like take seriously anybody who's like, oh yeah, my com I, I feel very nonchalant about my company or like very objective. It's like, no, you probably don't. I mean, you could be exceptional, but probably not. Yeah. I feel a deep sense of connection with all my creations. Whether it is a painting, a dish I've cooked, a business I've built, or a podcast I've engineered to create, in those times I feel a sense of wanting people to like what I've created. I feel like I would love some confirmation bias on what I've just created. And hearing feedback, whether constructive or destructive, is really, really hard and very, very necessary. I see this a lot with our clients when they start a podcast for the first time. There's something really vulnerable about putting your voice out there into the public. And I think that makes this whole experience really uncomfortable. I think the pressure of wanting to get it right and not looking like a fool is what makes my mind race. What if no one listens? What if they listen and I get caught in a media shitstorm for not even knowing whose buttons I've pressed. The worst fear of all this is the fear of missing out. I, I appreciate your like physiological reaction to that word because I think it's, it's such a powerful word and because it reflects such a powerful experience. I mean, just like to riff on it a little bit, like we are from our very earliest moments of conception, oriented toward others you know it, it, fetuses in in utero respond to the voice of their mothers i mean there's from the beginning there's a relative process of human beings and uh, of course our early years are completely formed by our attachment relationships and the sense in which we're cared for appropriately. So, you know, this might seem like a far step from entrepreneurs who are fully grown, but like at one point, all of us are formed by our relationships with other people. And I think that we are really kind of in a crisis of loneliness I'm, and I'm not alone in that opinion. Um, it, I think, is also amplified by things like social media that have the, the feeling of relatedness, but aren't. And when we are alone in our own thoughts and our own feelings, and then we see this sort of like relational porn of, oh my God, all these people are gathered in Mexico on this great retreat. I, why am I not there? They didn't invite me. Like, it's... Even among fantastically successful entrepreneurs, there's, you know, FOMO is what the kids call it, but like it's deeply triggering for us to feel like we're not enough. We're not in the right rooms. We're not doing enough. We're not worthy of being invited to this event or that event or this other person who seems, you know, not that much smarter than us is doing so much better on their social media reel. And I think... Loneliness is just amplified by comparison, 
which is sort of what social media does in our brains. And I think a lot of us feel alone, even the presence of others, because our highlight reel doesn't sort of measure up to their highlight reel. Maybe we are in the wrong rooms. Back in volume 21, Richard Litfin talked about why he thinks entrepreneurs tend to feel lonely. Yeah, one of the most common things I hear from the high performers I work with is, is this phrase, I don't, I, I don't feel lonely, but I feel very alone. So they're not lonely, like they don't ha- they, they, they've got plenty of friends. They're not sitting on their own all the time, but they feel alone. And that, once again, is why the title of my book is called When You're the Most Interesting Person in the Room, You're in the Wrong Room. Because I can sometimes feel lonely in the middle of a crowd. There's a paradox for you. But my people get that. They understand what that means. And, and so it's, it's finding, how do you find your community? How do you create your community? So the physiological reaction she's talking about to the word, the word was loneliness. This was so good. I was kind of making headway in understanding my mental tennis match with the devil and the angel playing long ass rallies inside my head. But the bit about feeling alone when things were hard was really, really hard to ignore. I think also for entrepreneurs, of course, it depends a lot on how their businesses are structured. But if you're the person, if you're the leader, all of that weight lives in your head. And you are the decision maker. You can have a great team, but at the end of the day, it stops with you. And some of us thrive in that. And sometimes it's fine, but there are moments when that can feel like a really lonely path. So you carry these heavy burdens and then you're immersed in a culture that's, whether intending to or not, basically saying like, work harder, do more, be better looking, go on better trips, blah, blah, blah. And I think people can feel, it's sort of imploding. Like you just like, crap, I'm not successful at this. Like, where's my fetal position in my, the corner of my room? Even those at the highest levels of success feel the sting of loneliness. In a Harvard Business Review, half of the CEOs from the CEO Snapshot Survey reported experiencing feelings of loneliness in their role. When we come back, we get into the clinical side of the imposter that lives inside us all. The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Before the break, we covered a lot about what goes inside our brains and how it gets amplified in certain scenarios. Now I wanted to geek out on some of the psychology I learned during my MBA. So I asked for the origins of imposter syndrome. I think that the, sort of our conceptualization of imposter syndrome is a, a kickback from Alfred Adler, um, who was a contemporary of Freud. And, and you might know his work, but he talks about um, these two kind of core strivings in human existence and that that much of what we do is organized out of our sense of inferiority. And so he argued, like sort of show up in the world feeling inferior, like we've got an older brother, an older sister who does things better than us and they learn faster. And so we're always kind of hedging ourselves against other people. So that's that comparison part of it. Perry Bostock had a really good example of this in volume 23 when she explained her mindset when she was set to verse her younger sister in competitive table tennis. My sister was actually playing table tennis as well. So she was um, on the verge of the national team. And when I was 21, she was very close to beating me. And I was getting quite nervous competing against her because obviously she's four years younger. I'm the better player. And if you're nervous, your standard drops automatically because your shots aren't flowing, your muscles are too tense, and you're not energetically fully there. So I actually considered giving up, and I almost did. But uh, something in my head 
said don't and I ended up going, okay, well, how do I get over this then? And I ended up training harder. I was due to play a tournament in Lismore and I ended up not going because I was too scared to lose. And then I just said to myself, this is really silly. And although I didn't like losing to her, it was the worst thing in the world. And he, he argued that you, you, you strive to sort of attain a level of superiority to alleviate your inferiority yeah. or, you, or you get stuck there. You sort of live there. Yeah. So inferiority or imposter syndrome is like part of human nature. Like we're, we all have it. Like absolutely 100%. We have moments where we're like, wow, I'm probably not measuring up here. And it, I, I think in some ways, um, I, and I'm really glad for the conversation. I think it's helpful for entrepreneurs to like have language to talk about this because it's, again, so much a part of it, especially because, again, ourselves are sort of intertwined with our businesses. And so as it falls and rises, so do we. I just said, well, that's it. If you quit, there's no going back. But if you keep going, work harder. So every day I did more physical exercise than her. I put more hours on the table than her. And I made sure that I could win every match. And I did most of the time. So, but then she, um, she became a lot better as well because she was, she started when she was nine. So I think the younger you start table tennis, the better it is for your reflexes, your coordination, the hand eye, everything like that. Um, but yeah, I just put in more work and my head just said, give up or go for it. And I went, go for it. And I stayed competing for another 10 years after that. So obviously I wasn't ready to retire at 21. That would have been silly. I would have wasted all that travel time and competition. Um, but I do think that sometimes we, we get a little bit over attached to it. And part of what I like to tell people is like, yeah, of course you have imposter syndrome. Oh, wait, we all have it? So the way to deal with imposter syndrome is to sort of realize it's not fucking about you in that moment. Like it isn't. it isn't when I get on stage, like if I'm like all in my ego, like I'm going to, I can deliver a good talk. But if I'm really thinking about who is in front of me and what do they need? Why am I here? I'm here to help like people be more compassionate towards themselves or whatever it is. That is the focus that gets you out of your own brain. And if your, you know, your role is to say, how can I like really help the people that work for me grow in their skills, have a good living, like have access to opportunities that they might not have had otherwise, or they wouldn't have if they work for a different company, that, that it's not about you. That's why you're there. So yes, grow into your own superiority, be the best, whatever it is that you are, but also that is not going to be a sufficient enough motivation. And again, in the moment when you're like, shoot, I don't feel like I'm good enough for whatever situation I find myself in right now, then you flip the conversation into who's around me and what do they need and how can I show up? And then I think that alleviates most of it. Who's around me, what do they need, and how do I show up? In volume 26, Noom Dara explained his thought patterns and how he showed up in his business when they went through a rough patch. You know, I didn't actually think about that until all the problems started. Because once the problem started, then I think about, you know, if the people who were working for me, I have to fire them, what will they do? Because each of them will have people that they need to support, their parents, their family, their wives, their children. So um, to, you know, to have now that I think about it um, and I'm thinking about it, that's uh, a responsibility that I need to be the custodian of, I guess, their, their success. That's what I feel my, my job is as well, not to only to, for the shareholders, but now I'm looking at all the stakeholders as so the stakeholders are not only the employees, but the families of the employees. If I have known or thought about it in the beginning, I would have been much more cautious because every step that I take forward means that I'm more responsible. I feel more responsible for, for those who trust me. And those who work for me, I believe they come to work for me because they have a certain trust 
in me or in what I stand for or what we're building. And um, for me to only look at one side, which is just to to push forward all the time without looking at the, the back end of the business, um, I feel um, that I did not do them proper justice, that I have been a little bit more irresponsible or a lot more irresponsible than I, than I have to be, than I, than I need to be. It's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. This reminds me of Nikki Me. If you've listened to any of my other podcasts, you've heard me speak about Nikki. Nikki runs a not-for-profit organization called Free to Shine that saves girls from being sex trafficked. Story for a different day. In 2017, I was asked to speak at TEDxUQ. And from the day I was told that I was going to speak to the day of delivery was exactly six weeks. In that time, I was in a state of I am going to mess this up in front of everyone. And here's what's really interesting. I don't get nervous before I go on stage. But somehow the weight of being on the TEDx stage made my mind make up some interesting and bizarre scenarios of how my talk was going to go. Then three days before the delivery, um, I met Nikki at an event and she asked me, Ronsley, how's it going? Are you ready? I proceeded to tell her for a good six or seven minutes how nervous I was and how it was driving me mental. And she just cut me off and said, it's not about you, Ronsley. And I was making this whole deal about me when it was actually about the message I was trying to deliver. I think we're not as careful with ourselves as we should be. <laughs> yeah. And, and burnout is... Um, different than being tired from too much work. That's a part of it, but there are some other kind of deeper nuances that um, go along with burnout that I think we're all slower to realize than I wish we were. And so when we talk about burnout more, more technically, there, there are kind of three components. And this is the work of, of Dr. Christina Maslach from UC Berkeley, who's been looking at this subject for 40 years. And there's now books and books of material written about this. Um, so burnout is physical and emotional exhaustion, which is usually the thing that people most associate with burnout and usually the thing that people realize, right? It's the immune system that's compromised. It's that cold that you can't kick because your body is worn down. It's not sleeping well because you're over caffeinating because you're tired and then you, you're in this cycle. So physical and emotional exhaustion is one component of it. Um, one of the other components though is cynicism and detachment. And that's perhaps this sort of overlay of, the, of loneliness, as we talked about earlier, but it's the sense in which you're no longer connected to the people that used to make your work matter, whether that's your teammates, whether it's your customers, whether it's your clients, whoever it is that you work with, you're like, screw those dudes, I don't care. I don't care. And so the, the more... Um, social, interpersonal, deeper level motivations to be successful kind of dissipate. They're not there anymore. So that's the, the second part. And the third one is a, a lack of a sense of efficacy, which is like the filter in your head switches to say you're not doing anything important. And that can be counter to tremendous amounts of evidence to the contrary, right? That you are being successful, that your work matters, blah, 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 that you're accomplishing things. It just, in your brain, all you see is that unfinished to-do list and all the things that didn't work and all the things that failed and all the people that are grumpy. And so that's really the sort of the, the, the trifecta of terrible. It's this exhaustion, it's cynicism and detachment, and it's the sense that like, I'm working so hard and none of it matters anyway. And so, and this is really specific to work. That's how burnout is different than depression or stress or other things that we talk about in the, the sort of mental health realm. The burnout is driven by what's happening in your job. And so um, obviously it's a really, really terrible way to feel and it's really bad for your brain. Um, the brains of people who are burnt out start to 
um, experience some like death of key neurons. We see an overactive amygdala, which is of course the part of our brain that regulates negative, negative emotion and stress. And the connection between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex starts to die. We call it neuronal wear and tear. Like the neurons become weaker and they start to atrophy which means that the very skills that we use to talk ourselves out of bad or difficult feelings, that that prefrontal cortex part of our brain where we sit down and, and say, you know, Sherry, I know you're feeling this way, but it's not, it's not really that bad. Here, look at this, look at this evidence that what you do matters. Look at these people that you're connected to. That that whole circuitry doesn't work really well. Yeah. So it's it's a pretty bad situation when we let ourselves linger in burnout for too long. And if we're not good at recognizing our our own individual warning signs that we may be getting burnt out and then taking the actions that we need to take to help protect ourselves. In volume 27, Ziva founder Emily Fletcher addresses burnout as a key factor to why meditation is important and why it has become so popular among entrepreneurs. It's like, what are we doing holding it all inside? It's making us sick. It's making us stupid. It's making us slow. It's wasting our mental and physical cycles. And if we let that stuff up and out through meditation or therapy or ayahuasca or exercise or whatever your path to healing is, it doesn't have to be meditation. For most people, meditation is a foundational component of their healing process and usually makes all those other modalities more effective. But if we use these tools to get the stuff up and out, there really is more room on the outside and then your body doesn't have to hold on to it via extra weight or sleep issues or chronic disease or pain or however it ends up manifesting on the physical plane. Okay, so I've been burned out. How do we deal with it? Things that cause burnout. One, not surprisingly too much work. So if you're gonna prevent burnout, you have to be able to say no. You have to have a task list that is actually reasonable for a human. And that means being clear about what your priorities are. It means saying no. It means being very selective with your time. Another sort of cause of burnout is not having clear goals. Our brains love to check things off a list. We get this like total like reward center burst when we're like, okay, done and done. And another thing that drives burnout is, is of course this sense of detachment of not feeling connected to other people. So again, the way that we prevent that, we flip it on its head. We make sure that we are prioritizing relationships, personal relationships, professional relationships, other humans, and making that something that's integrated into our lives on a daily basis, not something that we do on our off time or not something that's sort of an extra recreational activity that we place relationships at the core of what our day is. Yeah. And the, the last one, which is probably like the hardest to wrap our minds around is, is meaning, you know, it's, again, this sort of great, rich existential concept, but we can do super hard things when they're important things. But when we, are separated from the importance of our work when it begins to feel rote, when it begins to feel like I've got all these appointments today and all these calls to do, and we've forgotten why it is that it's important. That That's absolutely the recipe for burnout is when we're doing a lot of work for no purpose. And so the more that we can continue to tie or to be super aware of why it is that we choose to hold to, to put together our days in this way, yeah. to, to do this thing and not that thing, yeah. to have this conversation and not that conversation. Those are the things that protect us from feeling like our work is ineffective and meaningless and not satisfying. Before I actually witnessed my first burnout, I could not relate to someone else telling me what their episode of burnout was. And it's only after I witnessed it for the first time that I understood what was happening and how to get help, I suppose, became part of that journey. So I asked Sherry, who deals with entrepreneurs every day and is married to one and is a successful one herself. I asked her, what is the question that entrepreneurs should be asking themselves? So I I hope that we as entrepreneurs 
um, as we as we grow and mature, are finding whys that are about more than I've got this thing to work out or I have this drive and pain inside of me, but are about things that bring us joy, that make the world better. I mean, these sound sort of lofty and I, I feel like I could roll my eyes at my own self, but when we think about it at the end of our lives, we're gonna take stock of like, how did we spend our time? And the questions that we're gonna ask is what, what did I do that was important? How did I make my life better? How did I make other people's lives better? How did I experience joy? How did I, how many beautiful sunsets did I see? How many hard problems that I solve that made me satisfied and made me proud of myself? I think maybe the question that we don't ask is like, how is this going to play on the deathbed? That's a, that's the question to ask. What are we going to regret? What are we going to be sad that we missed when our time is up? What are you going to miss when your time is up? Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship. I'm Trevenia Barber and I am a mom and I am a business owner that is embracing everything light and dark about her to be a better person and to make a better impact on the world. It's hard to turn that to yourself, right? To look into the mirror and, and realize that sometimes the best way that we could serve is to serve ourselves. I still have a platform. I still have a responsibility to use it well. I guess my question is, is what's the motivating factor for change? Is it awareness or is it shame? Being ashamed isn't going to solve anything. I think action is what will solve things. Psychology of entrepreneurship. So I interviewed Cherry because she's the founder of Zen Founder and is a licensed clinical psychologist with extensive experience treating stress-related problems in high-achieving people. She is one of the first mental health professionals to creatively combine yoga and psychotherapy. A graduate of the University of California, Davis and Fuller School of Psychology, she has completed residential fellowships at Yale University School of Medicine and the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder affiliated with Boston University School of Medicine. She's the author of The Entrepreneur's Guide to Keeping Your Shit Together, How to Run Your Business Without Letting It Run You, co-host of the Zen Founder Podcast, along with her husband, Rob Walling, mother, friend, and confidant. Psychology of Entrepreneurship. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Voiceovers, editing, and sound design by Kelly Bonnyman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corin Castles. Project managed by Kelly Bonnyman. Produced and hosted by me, Ron Slivaz. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com.